Time is presented by Dollar Rent-A-Car. Right on the airport, right on the money. Boxing at its best is compelling with primal moments of drama. That is the ring. Inside the squared circle, this sport, this industry, a jumbled collection of interests, regulations, and dangers are frigid exercise in greed and expediency where so often the last concern is the person who stood or the currency of the sport. The business of boxing is capitalism at its best and worst. The rich get very rich, the little can and also get eaten alive like minnows and of shark. You get away with whatever you can get away with. That's about the only hard and fast rule of boxing. Fighters and promoters know it, and if they don't, they should. Over the 60 minutes, you will meet some of these people. Sergei Artemiev is He lost his career and literally lost his life. Vinny Pazienza, whose own mother can't bear to watch her son fight. You'll also meet one of Bakken Power Brokers, WBC President of Suleiman. We begin by almost two sensations to be real. The arrest and indictment of heavyweight Ray Mercer for allegedly offering a bribe to Jesse Ferguson. $100,000 allegedly offered in the ring at Madison Square Garden in February. Key charges brought by the New York District Attorney are tapes of the fight. From the third round on, Mercer and Ferguson can be seen and heard to each other. A key to the DA's office, the bribe was made in an early round, then repeated throughout the fight. The grand jury was shown several different fights from their angles using microphones. Mercer appeared in court in mid-July for a pre-trial hearing. Ferguson has not been granted immunity. Both he and Mercer will be fighting again in the near future. There is even talk of a match once this case is resolved. And the investigation is continuing. Prosecutors allege that Mercer offered the bribe to save a $2 million purse against Riddick Bowe. Ferguson's landscape is full of such lucrative days and possibilities, but there are only a few ways to get the promised land. It's the system, one that can, as Armin Katayan says, relegate the stars of the ring to the bottom rung of boxing decision-making land. <laughs> Right here, but you don't clean it up there. I'm rubbing now that I'm gonna shake the world. He's my manager and trainer, and I guess he's my, my my closest friend. I guess my closest friend. And we just were in. He's helping me make it in boxing. I see the champion. Amid the moon and rubble of downtown Detroit are havens of hope found here at the Kronk Gym. The have been working. I've been developing, developing. And I'm the deputy of the world. Luther Burgess has trained and managed fighters for 50 years, sharing his skill and wisdom with a Leon Barber, fourth ranked light fight in the world. Been boxing, been boxing, been boxing, been boxing, been Me and this man been loyal to one another for the longest, so uh, I trust him. Front, honor, lost sacraments in a sport long bent by bribery and scandal, chaos, conflict, double talk, and double dealing. There is no uniform. This is a sport that's out of control. It is just completely out of control. Former FBI agent and former Inspector General Joe Spinelli investigated corruption in boxing for 13 years. The system too often dictates that a fighter must leave his initial manager, initial trainer, to get ahead. Because the system is, is in a, the system of boxing itself is, is a monopoly. I'm like a lightning rod. And a I monopoly can try powerful promoters. To put up a million dollars, we'll put up a million a system without rules or regulation. Obviously, this is the best fight in history. They said to one of the promoters a few years back, I said, you remember a guy with a big bowl of spaghetti in front of you? With five starving people behind you, you're filled to the uh, to the limit on, on food. But you keep on stuffing it down your throat because you don't want anybody else to have any. And that's that's their way of thinking, is that they don't want anybody else to have any. Okay, has a few strands of spaghetti. Squeeze it tight. Manager Emmanuel Stewart feels squeezed out of the sport he loves. He lost four fighters. Tommy Hearns. It's happened to you. You've lost a lot of fighters. Yeah, it's just the nature of the business, and I have like that because it's. Uh, there's not that much loyalty and value in boxing. You see, what do you think about 
about loyalty. That's a, that's a special word for loyalty and time. No, no. For Bruce, the deepest loss was middleweight Dwight Davidson, a fearless fighter with a crushing right hand. In 1981, after 10 years on her side, Davidson was 28 and 0. First in line, challenge world champion Mark Hagler. You two were like this, loser. You took yes. him to the top. Yes. And then he left you. He left me. He went with Don Gaines. Uh, all the diamonds and the glitter and money flashing in my face and picking me up in a limo just went to my head. Dwight Davison chose to leave Luther Burgess and turn over to the arms of Don King. Once he did, that was basically the end of his career. I did fight for the title. He cried on my shoulder. The mistakes were made. It was me. Too late. Today, at 38, Davison realizes is a system gone bad. Bad personal decisions and mismanagement by the King camp have left him deep in debt. This is the only thing that I have right here. This is everything. And I'm like three years behind. So if I don't uh, get a job real soon, I take a, a big, big chance on uh, you know, losing everything. Super welterweight champ Taurus is one of boxing's big winners. He and his tough-talking manager decide together on what promotes who's and when, not the other way around. He still Terry, is. Terry and I are very, very good friends. He's been with me going on eight years. He's the highest boxer in boxing and the heavyweights. And if you want to achieve that, you have to do what those what he's done. You have to stay right there in his face and listen and pay attention and learn how I was uh, protected real well, and now I'm the best pound for pound best fight in the world. When a time Norris promoter couldn't deliver a pay-per-view fight on time, Sayadovich signed a $5 million deal with King and Showtime. There was a loyalty issue with Norris. How did you feel about that? Let's go on to the next one, Wayne. Right? It's my obligation to take care of me. Uh, not to hurt Danny, but to protect Terry. And King was able to produce those shows. That's where we went. Protection, trust, money, bond not yet broken in these havens of in a downtown gym where young strive to beat a system in desperate need of repair. If I'm loyal to the people who's loyal to me, then nothing will go wrong. Hey, what about this man right here? Oh, this man's coming with me. Most definitely. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am without his assistance. <laughs> How is it proven that and who determines whether a boxer is physically able to fight? In some states, it's really easier to get a license to box than it is to get a to fish. There's a clear danger every fighter steps into the ring. Each moment of each fight has the potential for sudden death. Literally. It was November of 1980 when Dooku Kim was killed in the ring by Ray Boom Boom Mancini in a WBA lightweight championship fight. It was seen on network television. And that made the death in the ring that the generation remembers the most. But since then, there have been plenty of others, and far too many close calls. <laughs> He doesn't remember a thing. Not the five punch combination that sent him to the canvas. Not the stretcher that sent him to the most perilous journey of his young mind. In the early morning hours of March 22nd of this year, surgeons removed a blood clot on the brain and placed him in a chemically coma for 12 days. Because he is alive, Sergei Artemiev is one of the lucky ones. Sir, let me... Very cool. Since 1945, it's estimated that over 360 deaths have occurred in the ring worldwide. Since the mid-1980s, the American and British Medical Association have campaigned for the abolition of the sport. That is unethical for physicians to deny sport. Uh, and not attempt to control it and, and, to, and to make sure that it, that it is as safe as it can be. Efforts to make boxing less hazardous have been doing now for many years and will continue. I don't think any of them will have a great impact, however, because as long as fists hit heads, brain damage will occur. A blow to the head can result in a concussion, hemorrhage, even death. But acute injuries are not the only danger. 
The chronic brain injury is a cumulative effects of a long career. Uh, similar to uh, the condition of Ali has this injury from boxing. Well, was that boxers that have a long exposure to boxing will uh, cause neurological problems uh, that may be characterized by poetry walking, slurred speech, problems with memory, Parkinsonian type. Uh, and long exposure to trauma is not limited to time spent in animal bowels. That's where most of the trauma occurs or inspiring. So I think that's the major issue. 20-year-old IVF super middleweight champ James Tony has been a pro four and a half years. With his manager's help, we estimated Tony spent 300 hours sparring strung together at six hours a day, 50 days straight, full punches and absorbing blows to the head. Just as many boxes develop chronic brain damage is difficult. Statistics range anywhere from 20 to 80%. I want to be out of it as quick as possible. I mean, people who have kids will probably understand that every time you step into the ring, it's life-threatening. Like brain damage, both acute and chronic injuries to the eye occur in boxing. 74 boxers in New York State who showed no symptoms of eye problems were given violated eye exam. The two-year study revealed the following. 58% had potentially vision-threatening injury. 24% had a retinal tear and 19% a cataract. We were uh, very surprised at that high number, and especially since we were asymptomatic boxers. Sugar Ray Leonard's eye problems are well chronicled, but another Sugar Ray, Sugar Ray Seals, a 72 Olympic gold medalist, also suffered retinas during his career. He continued to box into the early 1980s, passing eye exams for many state commissions, when in fact, Sugar Ray Seals could barely see. He is now legally blind. With no enforceable federal rules in boxing, medical regulation is a state-by-state, -state, crazy, patchwork-like quilt. Here's just a sample of life requirements. In California, a fighter needs a complete physical, dilated eye exam, and a neurological exam. In the state of Nevada, dilated eye exams are not required. And in Tennessee, if you have $15, you can get a boxing license. No medical tests needed. You'll go to stage. Believe me, I tell you, you'll go to stage where you get... Your yeah, yeah. electrician will come along and he'll examine you. A foot doctor will come along and he'll examine you. I mean, where the hell are they coming in and uh, testing, uh, testing an athlete? This guy can say, uh, you look good, uh, you feel good. Uh, stick your tongue out. Uh, uh, you know, uh, look in my head. Uh. The Florida Boxing Commission compiled a list of suspended boxers in an effort to regulate fighter safety. A knockout in most states requires 30, 60, even 90 day suspension for a fighter. But in Tennessee, middleweight Tommy Jean, with a record of three wins, 51 losses, was knocked out on April 6th, and then fought and was knocked out again just 11 days later. When a boxer wants to fight, he'll do just about it. Well, we examined a boxer who had a severe injury, which disqualified him from boxing. Sometime later, from another state, we were contacted and told us that boxer passed the eye examination. We found that impressive, and they discovered that a person that family was a boxer, but someone brought in by the manager to, to pass the test. With no enforceable medical code, fighters are vulnerable, and their problems are pounded because boxers have little, if any, medical insurance or pension plan. Sergei Arkhenov stepped into the ring on the 21st with a mere $20,000 for medical coverage. Three and a half months after his life-threatening injury, the Russian immigrant is weak, has memory problems, pays over $80,000 in medical bills, and Sergei Artemia has a family to support. Mama, Jim, the way, the way. Yes, yes. I will, I will be further. I, I, will, I will not be a champion. Next, this bloody sports new injury, the AIDS virus. Just Mom, I love it. I want to be a world champion. See, but I don't want to be like anybody else. I want you to be different. I promise you, Mom, I will be different. The influence of a mother on her son's boxing career is watching. Any holy field is but one who cannot bear to watch her son fight. I don't be looking at it. I go in my room and stop the door. I'll be trying to stay, uh keep them here and they try to tell me it's over. <laughs> it's over. And then the first thing out. I asked them, is he all right? They say, yeah. I said, who won? 
Le chiedera, chiedito. The Pazienza House in Cranston, Rhode Island. A home of deep devotion and faith. Beliefs are strong. The house, a shrine. By now, the car accident, the broken neck, the devil in a halo training for his car is all part of Tasmanian lore. I thought I'd be on a couch. It's like a big fat potato. Louisiana tried to convince her son to retire back then, but Vinny wasn't interested. God put him here, got him out of that accident for a purpose, and put him here to God, and whatever happens, happens. And I just pray for the best. I just pray for the best. As a child, Vinny was fearless, reckless. At age 13, he saw a movie and decided he knew exactly what he wanted to be. The real-life Italian stallion. You don't like the idea, but your wife, what does she think? She doesn't like it at all. <laughs> she goes not that at all. She didn't want no killer. But I said, I talk to her. What'd you say? Oh, I said, listen, listen, maybe he's a man. A year, two years, he'll quit. he catch a good bean, he'll quit. He never quit. And Louise never really got used to it. What mother could bear to watch her child succeed if this is what winning looks like? If what mother could bear to deprive her child of his passion, no matter what it looks like? If it's what he wants and he's happy, I'm happy. A hundred percent, I'm with him. Even if it's dangerous? Even if it's dangerous. That makes fight night interesting oh, what she goes through when you fight yeah she goes oh. holy hell she makes coffee nervous emotionally mentally physically i am no good i just fall apart oh what's the fight you know she sits in front of her little rose oh. there she prays away she gets nervous she blocks her ears my daughter's on a power she asks how's he doing and then my daughter goes no he's doing good and my daughter be screaming and holler over there oh. baby was lifting her it's like I am going the whole 10 or 12 rounds with him. It's something I'll never get used to. And they say, Louise, you should be used to it. And he's been fighting for years now. Every fight, I, it's worth it. It's hard. Now, the interview you saw with Louise Papian, who was conducted eight days before Vinny's most recent fight. She seemed a little nervous. You should see her fight night. Which you will when we come back to it. Vinny Pazienza had to sweat off five stubborn pounds at the last minute to make the 158-pound weight limit for his fight with Lloyd Hunnigan. Way into my worst moment in life. Today, he is 14 pounds heavier and hearing the sweetest sound of all. Hey, how you guys doing today? Hey, let me ask you something. At this point today, do you talk to your mom or do you wait till after the fight? I don't like to talk to her right before I fight because... She's all mushy, man. I don't like that. Yeah, what does she say? Don't get hurt. Don't get I'm... hurt. Be careful. I love you. Keep your hands up. I'm like, ma, <laughs> don't worry, man. It's a, it's a fight. I'm not going into the combat. <laughs> Done. Meanwhile, 350 miles to the north, Louise Pazienza is engaged in her own fight ritual. Vinny might be hungry. Louise is definitely not. People when they get nervous, they eat, eat, eat. I haven't eaten since yesterday. In two parallel worlds focused on one event, the waiting is the hardest part. Oh. Hope this fight don't go to distance if it does, we'll go on until like 10.30. Boy, it must be the house down at Atlantic City, huh? He is number one! Your book, our book, their book! Wrestling's captain Lou Albano is only one of many. And through the course of the evening, stop by to wish Vinny luck. I'm all right, man. Good luck. I know you can do it, man. Things are starting to pick up in Rhode Island, too. I gotta put that... Put that on now. See if they're gonna... I gotta put that tape on. Oh, Vinny. Vinny must be upset. He's not fighting yet. Finally, 
At 11 o'clock, Vinny makes his way into the ring. And Louise makes her way into the kitchen uh, for good. We begin round number one. Get up first, Vinny. Get him out of your fast. I'm just crazy. This fight better end now. There you go. That's it, Toronto. Better than his mother. Even from 350 volts, four states, and one kitchen away. You okay? You okay? No cuts. No cuts. No cuts. No worry about The winner by PKO, he's the Pasmanian Devil, Vinny. Has he? You're gonna win in the 10th round. The fight now over, there's only one thing left to do. Good for me, Angelo. Okay. Please. Angelo? Yeah! I just let go! You wanna kill the f for the love of God? He was going after me! He was going after me! He was going We'll see you tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay, okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye, The ordeal is over. Until the next time. Louise is drained. Once, a long time ago, she wanted her son to be a priest. It would have made following his professional career so much easier. But in the afterglow of this torturous evening, he doesn't seem to mind. Can I let Vinny give this up? I mean, for how I feel. See the glory of that win? That's everything. I'd go through this a million and one times. This is what he wants, and God bless him. That sense of glory and fulfillment is as old as the sport itself, but boxing now has a new dimension, one of apprehension and fear, AIDS. Boxing is the bloodiest of sports. Blood is spilled in close contact, involving not just the fighters, but their cornermen as well, and not just during bouts, but everyday training in the gym. Precautions for the HIV infection vary, as do attitudes. So you're taking the mouthpiece out, you're, they're getting cut, they got the, you're taking care of their lips and stuff like that, their eyes and stuff like that, and uh, all of a sudden some blood gets on. You don't know who it is, all of a sudden you have them over there when they, when they, you know? I went out and bought boxes of for my fighters, my, my trainers rather, my trainers, and I insist that they must wear the gloves in the, in the sessions right now. I'd rather not wear the gloves because, you know, uh, most of the time in the gym, I, I take a box piece out of my fighters, you know what I mean? I take it out and I rinse it off, you know what I mean? Now, you know, when I take it out, I don't say, you know, hmm, I wonder where my fighters has been. I'm not taking no chances with my fighters. And to me, it's like, well, it's the big scare. To me, it's the big scare. <laughs> For this fighter, the big scare has become reality. He says he's afraid of dying of AIDS. His faith in God will cure him. Last September, Ruben Palacio of Colombia won the WBO Featherweight Championship. On April 15th of this year, he was stripped of that title. He's the first fighter in history to be diagnosed with the AIDS virus while holding a world title. This is Medellin, near the heart of Colombia's cocaine region. Here, guns and drugs are the recognized currency. For Ruben Hurricane Palacio, this barrio in Medellin has been home for the past eight years. And it's for his family, for the people of the barrio, that he will wage his war against the AIDS virus. <laughs> The virus is my worst enemy right now. I know that this is the fight that I must quickly win. Two days before his first scheduled title defense in London, the bout was called off. Palacio was told only that he had an oxygen problem with his blood. 
At that point, I didn't realize how serious it was. The doctors lied to me, and I went back to Colombia, expecting to be cured and ready to fight again in a short period of time. And it wasn't until he returned to Colombia that Ruben found out he had the AIDS virus. Reporters at the airport told him. Palacio doesn't understand why the doctors failed to tell him the truth. If the doctors had never discovered the disease, I would probably be fighting without any problems and then contaminate people without knowing it. Just how real is the risk of transmitting the HIV virus in the ring? The main transmission seems to be with exchange of blood. Uh, that can occur in boxing and wrestling and some other contact sports very easily. I think if both boxers have open lacerations, it's a possibility. And of course, one case is too many. The first HIV testing for fighters began in Great Britain seven and a half years ago. Since then, of the 900 to 1,000 overseas boxers who have taken the HIV test, three have come back positive. In the U.S., only Nevada and Oregon require an HIV negative test for a boxing license. The test must be negative within 30 days of the bout. I think that every fighter should have the test done because, you know, that's your life being out there. I'm in favor of HIV testing, even though you're going to get a lot of uh, opposition, I'm quite sure, from boxers, because once he's found to be HIV positive, it means he's, his livelihood is really going for the most part, particularly if he's a world champion. A fighter's safety versus the right to make a living. It's a thorny issue. Federal law prohibits HIV testing as a requirement for employment and forbids revealing anything about a person's HIV status. It is this privacy issue that has stopped many states from enacting HIV testing. What's more important with this issue, the privacy of the individual or the people in the ring? The people in the ring. Duba has taken an HIV test three times. Just months ago, Nevada told Duba an HIV-positive fighter had had contact with Duba's gym. I cleaned the house, and we went down and had every one of our guys examined. Now what I do is, when I bring sparring partners in to train with my fighters, I'm around the... I march them out, I have them checked out first. While Duba is a proponent of wearing latex gloves, others feel they will do little to stop the spread of the AIDS virus. That's one reason that last month, the IBF became the first major boxing organization to rule that a promoter must provide evidence that both fighters are HIV-free before it is sanctioned. How that may or may not square with state privacy laws is yet to be seen. Well, if it could happen to that guy in England, it could happen right here in the United States in any fight that you have. We're not talking about someone just getting sick. We're talking about someone possibly expiring. While no one has yet documented a case of HIV being transmitted in the ring, in this most violent of pas de deux, the possibility may exist. Ruben Palacio says he has no fear as he waits for God to cure him. In boxing, he says, it is the strongest who wins, and his faith is strong. All the effort I put into winning a fight, I will put into winning this one. I wake up in the morning and sometimes I think I'm the only one on the face of the earth. Why? Because I have so much confidence that I will win this fight. I have a strong desire to stay alive. Next, the power in this sport, personal relationships and common interests. Alliances, relationships and common interests. There's one friendship that best illustrates how power is won in the sport where there are more rogues than rules. Boxing. A bare knuckles marketplace where power and profit belong to those who grab it. Nobody in boxing does anything to set a friendship. This is boxing's most intriguing friendship, an example of how the sport is run. Don King and WBC President Jose Suleiman. King and Suleiman certainly are, are very tight, no matter how much either one of them deny it. And I don't care if they deny it, because it's, it's true. They are. You can, it, case after case after case, is the WBC given, given Don his way. For example, withholding sanction of the 1989 Chavez-Mayweather fight when Chavez tried to leave King's control. 
ranking King's heavyweight Tony Tucker second even after a title loss. A fight where Tucker reportedly did not get the 30% first split King had promised the WBC. The WBC has global oversight in 134 countries. It has two full-time employees. Strict rules lose out to custom and tradition in running the sport. This is not a court of law. This is the World Boxing Council. Suleiman stirred world rage when he initially withheld recognition of Buster Douglas's win over King's fighter Mike Tyson. He later admitted he had no such authority. Suleiman was also accused of using forged absentee votes at a critical WBC meeting. His handwritten notes contain the same incorrect use of the word advice and the phrase support absolutely that also appear in reported telex from Russia. Addressing Suleiman's aide to cast an absentee vote. That and a fax from an African official were alleged to be forged. And I guess you've seen the telex that the Soviet, for the Soviet proxy at that meeting. You're aware of the allegation, are you not, that was made that uh, that was that was forged, basically. <laughs> There's forensic evidence introduced yes, to that effect. I, uh, let, me, let me tell you something. Uh, you call me Filipinski. He can tell you if it was or not. Repeated attempts to reach the officials in Russia and Ghana were unsuccessful. Suleiman later provided statements from the men in question that claimed the original document was authentic. The WB lives off its sanction fees, the stiffest in boxing. Sanction fees that in one three-year period provided income of up to $1.7 million a year. The IRS granted tax-exempt status 11 years ago, and so the WBC has no federal income tax. They did provide a detailed list of their benevolent works. They have a tax presence in Florida, but are in apparent non-compliance with the nonprofit laws of that state. There is no record of required reports and filings. In this environment, Don King has prospered, even though he's facing another federal investigation over possible insurance fraud involving canceled fights, including Tyson Holyfield. Have you been subpoenaed or any of your documents been subpoenaed? Well, I prefer not to, to uh, have a response to that question. King declined to speak and signed the line. It is the rare active fighter who will publicly accuse King of what so often is whispered that he underpays fighters and strong arms them into restrictive contracts. Everybody keeps mentioning that. Prove it to me once, and I'll call, I'll call Don King over to the commission's office. But you know, we have heard it so, so many times, and then you go to the fighters, and they say no. He offered me uh, $180,000 for uh, Basso Calimon, and they gave me 95000 Suleiman says that uh, Duncan lost money in the promotion. I said, I don't care, but he's not the loser. King and all the rest rely on option contracts to stay on top. Deals that lock up a fighter's future rights in exchange for a current bout. Options make boxing go round. The WBC officially frowns on multiple options. We say that if a boxer signs more than one option and close to the fight, he doesn't want to comply with that, and he reports that to the WBC, we take action not to accept it. Can you recall any instances when you have cut fighters loose from contracts that were beyond one option? I do not recall names now, but there have been many occasions in which boxers say, I don't want to comply with this anymore, and we have brought this into consideration, sure. That is not how Arguello remembers it. What could they done? Four days before the fight, they said the fight is not on. If I don't sign the option, you have to sign it. <laughs> and I look at the president, the WBC president, hey, Suleiman, you're supposed to be on my side. You're my president of the organism. Eh, sign the option. What can you do? Still ahead, Ray Leonard and Marvin Hagler, two men linked forever in this sports history, discuss the siren lure of the ring. After boxing, you know, what is that? You know, we get bored. Other athletes can quit. They can walk away. Boxers seem to have the toughest time escaping the lure of the ring. And this is the only man who can make that possible. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. But unfortunately, it'll never happen. Thank you and God bless you all. I have retired for good.
Well, I'm going to try to retire again, okay? I'm going to give it a shot. I, I've been proved to myself that I don't have it anymore. And uh, it took a turn Norris to show me that. Up next, boxing's opponent, the club fighters, who find it just as difficult to retire as the big name. I had to make a decision knowing full well that my mind, my speech, my eyes and everything about me was to the end of the ropes as far as taking abuse in boxing. Retiring wasn't easy for Marvin Hagler or Ray Leonard. And it's no easier at the other end of the boxing food chain. You're about to meet now a couple of club fighters, one who has no desire to quit, and the other who finally and reluctantly has. This is 27-year-old Tim Tomashik. He's single, he works on a loading dock in his hometown of Green Bay, Wisconsin. When he's not doing that, he fights under the name he gave himself, the Wisconsin Doughboy. At the other end of the spectrum, 34-year-old Greg the Gorilla Gorel, married with six kids, a college graduate whose career includes a loss to Lennox Lewis, and Gorel says, finally, he's fought his last fight. The most difficult reason for a boxer to, to announce or to actually retire is, is the problem with, with their ego. They, uh, by not being in the limelight, by not having that attention, uh, they feel part of their life has been removed from them. Professional club fighter in the Midwest is, um, basically there isn't too many in the Midwest uh, around anymore. Um, it's just got to be uh, ready at any time to fight anywhere, you know. It's a dying breed, that's for sure. The most enjoyable thing about my career is the people and the places that I've got to see and the people that I've met. It's fantastic that I've got to do the amount of traveling that I've got to do and meet the Muhammad Ali's and, and the great fighters of the past. The reason I think is basically to get away. It's like a diamond cutter making a perfect cut, you know. Mine is just fighting. <laughs> yes. It's the fuel, the cornfield, the good crowd who wants to watch two, oh, two fighters that are competitive and want to go at it, you know. There isn't nothing better. It sounds barbaric, but, you know, it really isn't when you come down to it. No more, no more force than that. The thing that Boston does that's good is it gives you another avenue to direct that, that aggression and that tension that you have in your life. I've had drinking problems. I've had drug problems. You know, it just, it seems like an abusive personality is part of the sport. I come from a good family, good, you know, people all around, and I don't need to really box. Actually, that's all this boxing's about. It's just, to me, it's just try to make people happy. I enjoy that. His last fight here in Wichita, he got hurt. And uh, I, then is when it really hit me, and I was scared. I, I wanted him out of it. About two days after that, I started having problems with my eyes. I, my memory has just uh, really been disturbed. He's an intelligent guy, 
and I want to be able to wake up in the morning and have a conversation with somebody without, you know, how some boxers can get. They get punchy. As far as injuries, um, much worse. Basically, a lot of stuff. I just, um, you know, put everything in God's hands, I suppose. It wasn't too long ago that I was offered a fight with a woman in Norris, and they offered me a lot of money. And it was a tough decision, but I think I made the wise decision when I turned them down because it's far more important to be able to raise the children I've got and just the wife I had. My parents, you know, they, they don't want me to fight, you know, my whole family always from them, but they're still in me and they let me. When I kids, when it gets on me, you know, they just don't enjoy it. The highlight of my career is I'm still mentally here. I'm still able to go in early in the morning and watch my children wake up and tell them I love them, and when they tell me they love me, I understand them. Is congressional reform in this sports future? Boxing on the Ropes returns. This is a bill proposing a national boxing commission. The bill has given little chance to get out of committee this session. The likelihood of the federal government involving itself in cleaning up boxing is remote, simply because there aren't very many votes from back home for a congressman or a senator who will champion the cause of gun intervention in the boxing. There are still too many other pressing issues in life. A half century ago, columnist Jimmy Cannon called boxing the red light district of sports, and you know what it's about. Everybody knows where it is. If you want what it has to offer, you know where to get it, and if you don't, you stay away. And that goes for promoters, fans, and fans alike. There's no people to not stay away. The lure of the sport, the spectacle of men alone in the ring, that lure is strong. However, the cynicism drives our pursuit of sport, and the way we feel for the men who spend lives in the ring. I'm Charlie Steiner. And I'm Bob Lee. Thanks for joining us. What are you packing? Elephant gun. This guy scares me, Dad. Me too. How do you want to handle this? Front door or fire escape? Take your pick. I'll take the front door. Just like old times, huh? Just watch your ass. You watch it for me. Give me three minutes to get set.
son of a bitch. I'm sorry, Jack. Are you going to be okay? Is there anything else you can tell us? No. Look, we, uh, we can't find his badge. It looks like the guy took it. Why don't you go home and we'll call you. What's wrong? Hey. I got Will Sturgis killed this afternoon. Who did it? Sweet. Is there anything I could do? Just leave me alone. Oh. Jeremy. Jimmy. I hire you guys because um, you're supposed to be best. I end up with uh, six dead, and uh, the bitch and Dylan still breathing. Well, no excuses, Mr. D'Angelo. But Dylan broke lucky. He was out in his car and got in behind us. It was a fluke. Fluke my ass, you stupid son of a bitch. Now I want her dead before 10 o'clock tonight. You capiche? You leave it to us, Mr. D'Angelo. We'll handle it personal this time. That's good. That's good. Because if you don't, I am going to take a gun, shove it up your ass, and blow your brains out. <laughs> Wipe that silly smile right off your face. Rosie. Betty. Um, I need a specialist. Your love is my love. I'll never let go of it. Darling, don't you know that your love is my love. I'll never let That's go. That's all. Is it one of yours? My cut of an old 60s tune called My Love. He was playing at Sweet's house. This afternoon we killed Will. So what are you going to do? I'm going to take him out. We've got to get to the studio. Where's Barbara? She went to San Francisco. She promised she'd drive straight through. How long ago did she leave? About a half an hour after you got here.
Okay, people, that's a wrap. Eddie wants us out of here early. Call time tomorrow, 8 o'clock. Look, Dylan, I'm, uh, you did good last night. Hey, look, you don't like me, I don't like you, whatever. But you gotta understand how the vibe is with me and Shanna. See, she, um, she likes all that rough stuff. I'm not sure I get mad and smack her around once in a while, but that's the thing. That's what makes it hot, you know what I mean? If you lay hands on her again, I'm gonna break them off and ram them down your throat. You vibe that? We gotta talk. Can it wait? Now. All right, boys, make sure. Eddie sends his love. 